In our last installment, we considered an introduction to the Sacrament of Holy Orders, its origins as seen in the scriptures, as well as a little bit of the basic history of how we have three grades or degrees of holy orders. In this installment, we want to look at the ritual by which men are ordained onto the three degrees and how this ritual truly has a particular effect in not just giving these men a task to carry out, but in configuring them onto Jesus Christ. When we looked at the origins of holy orders in the scriptures, we made note of how the imposition or laying on of hands by the bishop is the outward sign by which this sacrament is conferred. And surely as we consider the ritual of holy orders, it is this element that is central. But there are other elements to the ritual that are also important for us to consider especially minding that there are three different grades or degrees of holy orders, each which is a particular call onto life in Jesus Christ, configured onto him for the sake of service of his church and giving witness to Christ in the world. At the first level or degree would be the diaconate, or those who are ordained as deacons. And in this first grade or degree, we have a laying on of hands by just the ordaining bishop, no one else. And when the bishop lays hands, he then prays over that man so as to ask the Holy Spirit to come down upon him to give him that grace to serve and to be as Christ the servant after the manner of the seven men that are found in Acts of the Apostles, who were chosen or set aside for service so that the Apostles themselves could devote themselves to the breaking of the bread and the prayers, allusions to the Eucharist and to preaching and teaching. But the fact that deacons are this first grade, we emphasize their own call to proclaim the word. And so at a diaconate ordination, you will see in addition to the laying on of hands and this prayer over those ordained, calling down the Holy Spirit to give them this grace to serve, you will see how they, for their part, are handed the book of the Gospels, entrusting them with this ministry of the Word. As for ordinations of priests, again, it is the one ordaining bishop who will impose hands on the man or the men who are being ordained. But then, as an expression of unity within the priesthood, as an expression of true sharing in the one priesthood of Jesus Christ, all of the priests who are present are also brought forward to impose their hands on each candidate. And so, in this act, you have, again, a uh, a greater outward sign, the fundamental one being, of course, again, the bishop himself. But then you have this recognition of not just fraternity per se, but unity and oneness in the priesthood of Jesus Christ that is openly expressed by all of the priests there, in addition to the bishop, silently imposing hands. And in a priest ordination, then the bishop prays over the men, and ask that they would receive the graces of the priesthood, which include being able to carry out the offering of the Holy Mass as a very, as the very central element of their priesthood. Finally, when it comes to the priest ordination, we want to see the outward signs of how they are anointed on their hands with the chrism oil, their hands thus being consecrated for the sacred purpose for which they are ordained, but also how they are handed on the paten, the plate, and the chalice, the cup that are used at the Holy Mass. And these have already been prepared and they will be used at this very ordination Mass as a means of giving to these men this power to carry out the sacrifice, or at least 
outwardly expressing it as an explanatory rite, as we call it, because, of course, the power is contained within the very laying on of hands and that prayer calling down the Holy Spirit upon them. Finally, when we ordain bishops, it is here that things are much more particular because not only is it one bishop who lays hands, but there are to be two co-ordaining or co-consecrating bishops who also impose hands. And in addition to these three, then all other bishops who may be present will also come through, similar to how the priests do for a priest ordination, at the bishop ordination, all the bishops will come through and impose hands on he that is to be ordained. But it is important here with a bishop ordination that we understand that they too have certain insignia and certain elements of their outward vocation that are displayed at the ordination. Because in addition to that, once again, praying that the Holy Spirit comes down upon the man being ordained a bishop, we give to the bishop, or the bishop, the ordaining bishop, presents to him the various insignia of his office. His mitre, or the pointy-shaped hat, is given to him as a sign of his teaching, as a sign of his authority to preach the gospel and to direct people towards the kingdom of heaven. Then he is also given his ring, which is a sign of his being betrothed to his local church, his diocese. And he is also given his pastoral staff, which is sometimes called the crozier, which is like a shepherd's staff with a hook on the top of it. And this, again, gives a sign of his authority, his governing of the people, his leadership. And then finally, he takes his place in his chair, the cathedra, as it's called, at the cathedral church, where he truly has his proper seat to teach, and from there, to govern his people, sanctifying them as Christ for his diocese, as the fullness of the priesthood. And so these elements are present in these different ordination masses, but also, we want to note that at an ordination, before we even have the imposition of hands, each man is questioned according to what they are about to receive. So at a deacon ordination, the man is questioned with regards to, yes, his intentions. And if a man is being ordained so as to later on become a priest, he will be asked about his commitment to celibate chastity for those who are ordained to diaconate as a permanent state and are married men. Of course, we do not ask that question of them, but they are also asked various questions about being willing to serve and to pray in union with the church. And at priest ordination, similar questions, but more pertaining to the life of the priest. These are asked of them. Meanwhile, at a bishop's ordination, again, there are questions asked of him that pertain to that fullness of his office and their willingness to carry it out. And it's important to note that in each of these ordinations, as the men answer affirming that they are yes, ready, and they say I do to each of these questions, there is always a question and it is the final question at each of the three grades that has to do with are they willing to be conformed unto Christ and to grow in holiness according to the grade of holy orders in which they have been invited to receive, to which they will say, I do with the help of God, thus acknowledging that no one receives this because they are worthy in our own sense, but it's always with trust in God that we receive the gift of holy orders. But speaking of that, it is also important that we understand and recognize that those who are called to holy orders, no one has a right to it. There's a proper level of approval that must be granted to each man who is ordained. And so for those who are ordained deacons, whether it be those in the permanent diaconate or those who are being ordained deacons onto later being ordained priests, what we call transitional deacons. There are those who have to 
acknowledge that, yes, they have been rightly trained and they have rightly carried out the works to be called to orders. And this exchange happens right there within the Mass where the bishop will will hear the names of the men who are being presented and then a representative, whether it's from the seminary, let's say, or someone from within the diocese who can rightfully speak on behalf of the candidates, will ask the bishop, Most Reverend Father, we ask you to ordain this man or these men as deacons or as priests, to which the bishop will say, do you know them to be worthy? And the response will be after considering their training or con or conferring with those who have been overseeing their training, we find them to be worthy. And then the bishop will acknowledge that, saying that we rely on the help of God and of our Savior Jesus Christ, and we choose these, our brothers, for ordination onto either diaconate or priesthood. As for a bishop ordination, it is much more formal than that, because no man of himself truly chooses to become a bishop. Or no man prays and says, I think the Lord is calling me to be a bishop, the way that we who have received diaconate and or priesthood are called in that sense, where we prayerfully discern and ask, is this who the Lord calls me to be? And thus pursuing it through the rightful channels and the rightful study and rightful prayer, etc. No, the ordination of a bishop requires the appointment by the Pope himself. And so at a bishop ordination, you will hear the dialogue to this effect, where the representative of the local church, the diocese, will say, Most Reverend Father, we ask you to ordain this man as bishop. What is the reply? Not, do you know him to be worthy? No. The ordaining bishop will say, Do you have a mandate from the apostolic see? To which the reply, so long as there's one to be had, will be, we have. And then the ordaining bishop will say, then let it be read. And then everybody sits as the representative of the Holy See, the nuncio as we call him, go, comes forward and reads the mandate, the very appointment letter of the Holy Father of that particular man as a bishop. And it is this that establishes his rightful call to be ordained as bishop. And so these elements are all part of the right. And as for the effects of the right, we want to again emphasize configuration onto Jesus Christ, either as servant in the case of the deacon, or onto priesthood and the offering of the sacrifice of the mass in the case of the priest, or onto the fullness of the priesthood and the fullness of the shepherding and overseeing of the, the life of the church in the given locale, in the case of the bishop. And so these are the elements of the ritual, and in a very general way, the effects. And so next time, we will look more at the minister of holy orders, as well as the recipients, and talk a little bit more about some of the training and some of the requirements for those who are ordained. May God bless you.